I'm going to do a little bit of deep dive into the hottest topic that is right now, that is artificial intelligence, and how artificial intelligence intersects with one of the first and most important step, that is test case and test case generation. When we start with any project, the first steps that people start off with is understanding what are the requirements and then creating test cases out of it. And one of the most effective things we see the use cases of AI in this scenario is how that specific use cases of AI intersects with the whole process of software testing, specifically the process of software uh, test creations, right? So this is, I think, a very interesting topic. Uh, in our survey, we recently did our survey on uh, future of quality assurance. And there as well, we see that currently nearly 46% of testers are effectively using AI tools. And the highest usage of AI tools is either in test data generation or in test case creation. Right? So I'm starting with you guys, Adam. Let's see, what do you, are your thoughts on this subject? Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's the thoughts and there's the, the practices. So it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned that. So we recently rolled out a, a, a plugin for our test management tool, uh, mm -hmm. and it was sort of an experimental plugin to get you know, user community feedback and see what they thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What it does, it takes a requirement which you generate, which you write, and it, it and it will generate test cases. It also generates risks, it will identify risks, and it can do BDD scenario generation. So it, when you talk about the requirement, it also it's not just generating test cases; it's also all the ancillary information around a requirement that often needs to be thought through. So you know, if, if you think about it pre AI, what would we do? We come up with a user story or a requirement or an epic, you know, whatever combination you're putting together, and then you go talk about it, think about all the possible things that that requirement implies like what work will need to be done what development needs to get done um what are the risks we should think about mitigating which testing you know is a mitigation for many risks so when you think about that whole process that would be people on conference calls zoom meetings or in person in the old days of whiteboards a lot of a lot of that was just you know brainstorming and past pattern analysis so how do when we do that session what was happening is people are bringing all their experiences from previous projects and thinking about well i did this project that was an erp upgrade for sap this requirement reminds me of that. Therefore, I think we should think about these tests, these risks, these um, former aspects. So it's basically pattern matching. We humans are good at that intuitively, but we often have biases. So if I've done an SAP project, I'm now doing an Oracle project, just to pick an example. Well, I'm going to bring all my SAP biases to this new requirement, even though this project is not SAP, just because that's my experiences. So the real benefit of AI is A, of course, we have this plugin, you can push a button and generate a bunch of test cases and a bunch of risks. And that's that's a great piece of functionality. It saves time. But more than saving time, it mitigates the bias effect, which is the AI doesn't know that this you or we were previously an SAP engineer, it's gonna look out and say, This is a, a, a you know new requirement to create an order management screen for Oracle Financials. It's gonna go out and do its research from its large language model. It's gonna come up with all the test cases and the risks and all the information for that. It's not gonna be biased by previous experiences. So then the team takes what the AI generates and can then apply their human experiences and human biases, which is a good thing because often the thing that's quote smells wrong to a, to a business analyst is important or a test designer, but you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting kind of the objective view from AI and the subjective view from humanity. You put it together and this human AI team is stronger than the sum of the parts. Uh, that would be sort of my, my thought to start with anyway. Shreem, what do you think? I, I completely agree. You know, one of the important things about any project for that particular matter is uh, it's not just a scope alone. So the product owner, project manager, somebody coming and telling this is what the requirements are. Um, what AI does is is putting a spotlight on some of the blind spots. You know, there is known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns and unknown unknown, right? So it is now putting the <laughs> spotlight on okay what are my blind spots in my requirements um so conceptually technically um you know schedule scope and all the other elements that comes with that we are able to see and say all right now that i know a little bit about the unknowns that i have not factored in what should i do and this comes from both the management angle as well as from the uh, you know, technical delivery team angle. So what we are trying to do at this particular point is elevate that information and see now that I know more information about what will impact my project and ultimately the targeted audience of my, you know, my uh, product, uh, what should I do? So it's focusing on that good quality information. And one of the things that uh, Adam also mentioned is that uh, human 
artificial intelligence team. Now, if you think about the, the artificial intelligence as an additional team member, because they are providing some input, right? You know, uh, unpaid or paid, however you want to call it, like, you know, it's an additional team member who is providing some intel, and that person has to explain that person himself or herself, right? So it's very important that the AI is also able to explain the reasoning and the rationale begin why I said this, why I am trying to tell this and stuff like that. So it's uh, one plus one is always greater than, you know, three. That's the idea behind uh, artificial intelligence coming and adding value for requirement scenarios and test case scenarios. That's the kind of very interesting point. We were talking about that uh, artificial intelligence kind of as an added tool set, uh, let's say value add uh, accelerator of sorts and uh, the, one of the biggest advantages is that it removes few of the blind spots so that also interacts intersects with one of our key metric that kind of organizations are going after that is test coverage or uh, let's say overall coverage of the whole core itself as well so what do you guys think that uh, can the organizations first rely on ai for this concept of test uh, test coverage and if they can, how they can effectively use the AI components to kind of drive that test coverage. So if, if I can uh, take that lead in this particular question, and then, you know, probably I'll pass it back to you, Adam. Um, no so one of the important things that we have to keep in mind is the answer in a nutshell is going to be yes, but it's a hmm. qualified yes. Yes, we can hmm. use AI to generate test coverages, but AI relies on uh, the training data um, that it is using to create all this information. So even if you take ChatGPT, for instance, you know, it's it's uh, gathering all the language models and then putting some information about where the data is coming from. So garbage in, garbage out. So if the training data is not going to be very good or stale, then the, the outcome that is coming from the test generation, test case generation, is not necessarily going to be effective. So one of the things that we have to, you know, constantly think about is, you know, I'm sure you probably are aware of this, uh, you know, big, uh, so four Vs of the big data, you know, the volume, the veracity, the velocity, and um, um, variety. Um, so if you look at that, you know, you have to constantly be in a mode where you are engaging and training the data model itself so that the outcome you are creating from the AI model is going to be, you know, very effective. So it will be helpful for edge cases, uh, you know, boundary scanning um, and making sure that you are able to come up with not just happy path scenarios, but also unhappy path scenarios, exception flows, uh, alternative thinking um, that comes up with, uh, you know, the use case generation and stuff like that. So I think it can be used for a number of different things, so long as you constantly keep the training model effective. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, risk-based testing, for instance, it can come uh, and add value to it. And even in Spira, we have risk-based modules where we are able to come and say, based upon the risk score associated with the requirements, these requirements require to be, you know, test tested more thoroughly than, you know, some other models. So if you have limited amount of time, what is the requirement I should really test? So it comes up with all those scenario thinking and then create the test case uh, as well, test cases as well. Um, what do you think, Adam? Um, that yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a qualified yes is exactly the right answer in terms of so in terms of generating test coverage, uh, you know, in in our experimentation, we said we we released this plugin, right? And we thought it would be people would play around with it, but many of our customers are in these sensitive, complex industries like insurance and and banking, and we're thinking that although this might be useful for an e-commerce website or something very simple, is it going to be useful in a more complex industry? Well, it turns out these people have been very excited about the plugin; they really want to use generative AI. AI, and when we've been doing our you know our testing and we do demos and webinars with the, with the tool, it's amazing. You put in a, a single requirement like I want to be able to reserve a hotel room and it's able to generate useful i mean it generates like 10 10 to 20 test cases which are very useful and you know our, our head of qa looks at it and goes you know of that 20 test cases it generated um 10 were things that were somewhat obvious that i would have thought of but it generated them in 10 seconds to, to create them all or upload them from an excel sheet would take i don't know half an hour to an hour so even the ones that they knew of were a time saver so there's a productivity benefit mm -hmm. for test coverage generation the second thing uh, of the of the remaining ten, five were things that didn't make sense that we deleted. That obviously then takes time up, but but they are thought provoking. And the last five were ones that we haven't thought of initially. They were things like booking a hotel reservation with, the, with you know for uh, for four years. 
hotels don't like you doing that. That's a different kind of business model. And we wouldn't think to do that as a tester often. Or a hotel, we did a flight reservation and it said, try and book a flight to the same city. So there were things that as a human, you know, they're negative test cases, but you often overlook them. And so it was very good at, at generating both a combination of happy path, as Shrim mentioned, and boundary condition test cases. Um, I think when it gets into a qualified yes is, these are also use cases that the general public is aware of. So there's a lot of trading data about booking flights. I mean, how many flight reservation systems are there? You know, Expedia, Travelocity, Booking.com, Hotels, you know, .com. There's a lot of public data out there. So an LLM is very good at that. But let's say we were developing a brand new IT system uh, or a brand new, you know, wearable device that no one's seen before. It's heavily patented. It's got very restricted IP. First of all, you probably don't want that going out into the public LLM. But even a, even a private LLM, won't necessarily have enough training data. There won't be enough variety of data. So as you get into some more specific requirements that are more niche use cases, there may not be as much benefit, as much lift from AI, just because there's not as much data. And that's where you have you know, human researchers um, and other kinds of AI may help though, non-generative AI, things that are doing data analysis of your industry, you're crunching large data that's very industry specific. That could be a more useful approach than sort of generative AI, which is more text-based completion. So. Um, I think AI will be useful, but maybe other flavors of AI may come into play more. So like cognitive AI, the kind of things like IBM Watson, like the original right. application of yeah, AI. Yeah, the deep learning, deep learning deep AI, machine, not, yeah. not necessarily generative AI, which is just one, one type of AI use case, it's one type of model. So like right. people are very happy about generative AI today, but AI has been around since 2016. Oh. I've been hearing IBM Watson, right? And uh, Google, for example, right. they have been using deep learning in their searches on, I think a decade now. Uh, so, Absolutely. So, yeah. And one of the things, one of the AI use cases we're looking at is completely different to generative AI. What, the, yeah. what it is, is they're building a model where they're looking at all the code commits in a, in a Git repository. They're looking at all the test failures and correlating mm -hmm. those to see if we make these kind of code commits, which kind of test should we do? Predictive maintenance, we would call it in a, in a manufacturing environment. And that's a different type of use case and we have a partner that's working on that right now but that's beneath the kind of the spotlight as you say everyone's looking at generative ai it's gonna do all yeah. this stuff and it is yeah. but that's just one track of ai and there's so many other tracks that are ongoing i think the risk yep. is that all the money flows to just one use case you know everyone follows the hot money and that's the big danger so all these other branches of ai are going to get defunded or deprioritized and that could be a big loss to the industry yep you know, that, that what you think. Sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, so extending some of the concept that we were just discussing over here, mm -hmm. one of the things that we also have to think in terms of the test case generation or test case coverage and stuff like that is abuser persona. So I, I've been uh, long speaking about abuser persona because a lot of times we are actually creating the unhappy and happy path scenarios based upon the persona that we already know. I mean, today's products are getting a lot more sophisticated. Like, you know, you don't even have a user interface like software as a medical device. You, uh, you know, so when you are having a implant on your heart and there is no, you know, press one to do this or go to a menu bar and do this. You know, no such thing, right? So having a heart attack, this, press one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So all the ad updates are happening at the same time. So, you know, when you are looking into these kind of sophisticated uh, product development, you can also think in terms of uh, hackers, like how can a hacker actually abuse this uh, interface? So thinking about those abuser personas and coming up with test cases for that. So as your product is maturing, you also want to start thinking in terms of, okay, it's not just the requirement and the test cases. It's like, what are the other types of people who may have a malicious intent um, and, you know, hack the system completely differently. And, you know, uh, it may end up in life loss coverage at this point. So there is a lot more to think in terms of where the test cases can actually come into play, not just creating a test case like as a user do this, but who is that user? You know, it can even elevate to additional right. levels. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights on all of this.